introduce yourself and okay. um, explain sort of your relation to the whole overriding concept of sustainability. All right. My name is Bill Rees. I'm a professor in the School of Community and Regional Planning at the University of British Columbia. I'm trained as a population ecologist, but for the last, oh, 25, 30 years, I've gradually moved over to teaching uh, ecological economics and the ecological basis of human development. And in fact, most of my research has been directly centered on the ecological and social requisites for a sustainability, uh, most of which are nowhere near in sight as we speak. Uh, that won't be on the... No, yeah, that's, that's just sort of for just our for, yeah, sure. <laughs> as much as anything. We'll, we'll remember you yeah, yeah. going back through hours and hours of footage. Um, so, yeah, if you want to just sort of talk to me, and, okay. um, that, that'll be perfect. So, um, what is ecological footprint analysis? <laughs> I'm often asked, you know, what, what is the essence of ecological footprint analysis? And it's just a simple way of measuring an individual's or a population's impact on the surface of the earth. In fact, it's measured directly in terms of the area of productive ecosystems required to produce all the resources that you or a population of a whole country uh, require. And uh, the ecosystems needed to assimilate those wastes. So we have to recognize that humans are part of ecosystems. In fact, we're the major consumer organism in every single ecosystem type on the planet. So the question arises, well, how much of the Earth's surface is dedicated to servicing the human species, both by producing resources and assimilating wastes? Um, one of the interesting things about eco-footprinting, and in fact I, I divine, d devised it this way, is that it makes a direct connection between people's consumption, everything you consume is produced by the earth in some way or another, so we connect con consumption to sustainability using land as a general surrogate. So everyone understands consumption, everyone understands land, and they immediately get it. So my footprint is the amount of land needed to say, sustain just me in the style to which I'm accustomed. Awesome. Okay. Um, how as a species, or as so-called developed nations, living outside of the planet's means, or how must our lifestyles change? Well, to put it very bluntly, even if we just take a global average, which means you know, 4 billion poor people as well as roughly 2 billion relatively well-off people, the average ecological footprint is over two hectares per person now in terms of global average productivity. But if you add up all of the productive land and waterscape on Earth, uh, there's only about 1.8 hectares per capita. So even on a global scale, we're about 25 or 30 percent in excess of the capacity of the planet to cont uh, continue to produce for us. So even school kids ask right away, well, how can we be living on two and a half or 2.2 hectares if there's only 1.8? And the answer is that we're, we're drawing down enormous stocks of resources that have built up over time. So we're over-harvesting our forests, we're over-harvesting fish stocks, the soils are becoming uh, eroded. And so we're living as if the planet were about a third larger than it really is. And as a result, we, we can keep this going for a little while, but we're shrinking the earth under our very feet. And at some point we're going to hit an, an upper limit. If we go to the extreme end, uh, in North America, for example, the average person needs almost nine hectares of global average productivity to sustain our lifestyles. Well, your fair share is only 1.8 hectares. So it's just impossible to imagine everybody living at North American standards on the kind of a technological base that we have today. We'd need four additional planet Earths, and that's up from probably two just 20 years or so ago. thing that I'd noticed in your work, um, and this is a little wordy, but um, if you could, if you could describe the apparent <coughs> divorce from natural surroundings and or biological systems that drives much of our behavior, or how is conceiving of ourselves as somehow separate from nature flawed? Oh, well, uh, the only place, okay, let me start over because... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> The question is, how is it that human beings have begun to see themselves as so separate from nature? And this is a question that has very, very deep roots in Western philosophy. Um, it was solidified as a kind of philosophical concept by René Descartes way back in the uh, Renaissance, 
um, the, the scientific revolution. Descartes was one of the founders of the scientific revolution. But a way of thinking about humans in relation to nature was developed from his idea that we could divide reality into the realm of the mind, which became the human domain, and the realm of matter, which was everything else, the external environment. And this became the basis for human beings in our culture, Western culture, uh, segregating themselves or isolating themselves from the environment and objectifying nature. And we picked this up as a, a scientific methodology and as a philosophical basis for separating our disciplines from nature, at least the way we think in our disciplines from nature. So in economics, for example, a kind of an absurdity has evolved in which while well, economics deals with humans and their use of material, we think of the environment as a separate entity from nature. So that impacts of humans over here on the environment out there become externalities. They're outside of the system that really counts. And we see this over and over again in every one of our disciplines. Even ecology took many, many years to recognize that humankind was part of nature. So when I was a graduate student, there were no courses in biological human ecology. I was told, oh, if you want to study people, you go to anthropology or sociology or economics. We don't deal with it as ecologists. So ecologists study the relationships between non-human organisms and the environment, leaving humans out of the picture. So wherever we look in our universities, we see this built-in philosophical positioning of our culture that keeps humans separate from nature. And it's reinforced by our religious uh, beliefs in, in Christianity, Judaism, and so on and so forth, so that it's an endemic problem in our culture. But uh, the point I would really like to make is that the only place in which humans are separate from nature is in the human mind. The deep and dark reality is that we are an integral component of our ecosystems and we are destroying the very basis of our own existence by being ignorant of our dependence on nature. Long answer. No, that's great. Um, um, I don't have strawberry juice running down my chin or anything? No, no. <laughs> you're good. Um, <laughs> So while Europe isn't an especially balanced or ideal model to aspire to, as a lot of people kind of hold it up as the holy grail of sustainability in the Western world, um, where should we be looking for inspiration? Well, many people ask, is Europe really that much further ahead than we are? Is it a place to look for inspiration? And in some ways it is. We're uh, debating in Canada carbon taxes. Well, there are half a dozen countries in Europe that have had these as a matter of routine for some years now. And in many other respects, in terms of taxing pollution and other bads and, and releasing uh, people's tax burden in terms of goods, such as income, they're way ahead of us. And we just have to acknowledge that. There's a reason for that, I think, and that is Europe is obviously more overcrowded than we are in, in North America. They have a much longer history of conflict and all the rest of it. But in some ways, this has brought Europe together. But Northern Europe, for example, in particular, has always been more community-oriented, socialist, if you will, than we are. So in many respects, Europeans recognize that this is, sustainability is the single most important collective problem that we have. And there is no way that individual actions can address this problem adequately. If I do everything I can as an individual, which is what we prefer to do in North America, to be sustainable, I can't get there. If I live in a city where there's no good transit, I can't create the good transit. If we really need carbon taxes or resource depletion taxes to induce conservation, as an individual, I cannot implement those things. So what Europeans have ahead of us is a capacity to recognize that these are collective problems requiring collective solutions, meaning government intervention in the economy. Because unsustainability is the greatest example of what economists would call market failure we've ever seen. And when you see uh, major examples of market failure, it's perfectly legitimate for governments to intervene to correct the market so that pay, uh, prices tell the truth, for example, which is the purpose of, of some forms of taxation. On the other hand, Europe is already is planning to implement or build 20 or 30 new large coal-fired plants. So despite the uh, rhetoric around reduction of carbon emissions and so on and so forth. They're just as addicted as we are at base to, to many um, of the technologies that are they're causing the, the real problems. The, the frank reality is I don't see any so-called advanced or high-income country on earth that we can look to 
uh, for guidance here. This is a new experiment for all of us. And if you look around the world at the kinds of solutions that are coming out of such countries, Europe included, Australia, Canada, Japan, and so on, almost all of them have to do with efficiency. We believe that if we merely become more efficient, we can carry on doing exactly what we're doing now. So we see automobiles like the Prius held up as marvels. Well, they are marvels of technology in one sense, but they're by no means sustainable. If everyone was driving a Prius, the world would be no better off than if everyone was driving almost any other ordinary car. When you look at the full life cycle analysis of what goes into the, the production of a Prius, we're trying all sorts of ways to develop alternative energy forms, not to use less energy, but to use exactly the same as amount of energy as we're using right now to maintain our lifestyles. And I've been arguing for years that unless there's a fundamental change in our values, the discovery of an abundant, cheap alternative force, a form of energy would be catastrophic for the sustainability, certainly of other life forms, if not for human beings. Because when you think about it, most of the damage we are causing to the planet Planet. the depletion of fisheries, the overharvesting of uh, forests, the uh, destruction of soils, and so on, is the result of the application of abundant, cheap energy. And so if we found more of it uh, to replace fossil fuels in the same way, and we just kept acting exactly the same way as we have uh, for the past 150 years or so, then the destruction of the planet would uh, continue unabated. It might help to solve the climate change problem, although I think we've gone pretty far into that one now and we're not likely to solve that one without some uh, real uh, problems in the future. The simple fact of the matter is uh, we'd simply replace those problems with other problems that emerge from the new technology and our overuse of other resources. So frankly, there's no source of real inspiration in my view on the planet today. And what is going to be required if we're gonna make real progress here is a serious re-evaluation of the fundamental beliefs, values, and assumptions of Western technological society that growth is forever and that we will benefit from an ever-growing material standard. Even that's a myth because in the best, uh, in the richest countries today, it's very difficult to show a positive correlation between increasing incomes and consumption and people's perceived or objective well-being. What a stupid species when you think about it. Because here we are, dedicated to the proposition of endless material growth, while it is destroying the ecological basis of our existence, while providing no evidence for most people that there is any, anything to be gained from maintaining this path. It doesn't make much sense. And I keep repeating to myself, where is the evidence of intelligent life on Earth that we would ignore our own scientific evidence that we're destroying the earth and that there's no gains to be made from further economic growth. We've long since passed the point where people's well-being is really increased by more income. And instead, we're creating a planet that's lopsided with more and more people getting richer and richer, but an equivalent number falling off the wagon altogether and, and uh, you know, dying of starvation life and suffering. Ethics, that's it's right. It's, it, uh, that's where we're headed. I think we're headed toward lifeboat ethics. Yeah. Um...